everyone, I'm Dr. Mark Sharona, and this is Going Deeper. I'm delighted that today we have with us Dr. Chris Green, and this is our special Good Friday Lenten message, and at the end, I want you to get ready to have the Eucharist with us, so prepare yourself with the bread and the beverage as we prepare to prepare for the Eucharist. Beloved, we are in the Lenten season, and historically, Lent is a time of self-reflection, repentance, a time of humbling ourselves before God and understanding that the journey to the cross is a very grounding journey for us as Christians, that the mark of the cross has to be on us the whole way from our salvation in its inception all the way to the consummation of the kingdom. Our whole life is cross-shaped, and it finds its culmination for us in the Pascha event, O Christ our Passover, on Good Friday. Now, it's an interesting thing that we call it Good Friday, but I may start there as we look at John's Gospel, chapter 18 and 19, on the events that take place that bring us to the place of Golgotha. But Dr. Chris, it's Good Friday. Why is it Good Friday? Yeah, I mean, I mean that seems all kinds of wrong, right? I mean, this is when our God suffers and dies. It's good because of what is accomplished, right? In spite of everything, God in suffering and dying overcomes evil and death, right? That he tramples down death by death. So we only know it's good in the light of Easter, but in the light of Easter, we see that it is in fact good. This, the, the worst thing that could happen has happened. We've killed God and God rises from the dead. You just said a mouthful, we've killed God. <laughs> yes. That's yes. not normal language for a lot of folk. And it's, it's true, um, yeah. you know, but, but just, just go there before we go into John 18 and 19. Yeah, I mean, th this is what draws us together as Christians. I mean, we, we are people who believe that Jesus is not simply a man sent from God, as John is. He's not simply a prophet, that he is God in the flesh, right? He's fully human and fully divine. He's God living a human life and he's God dying a human death. And what's striking in John's gospel that you've mentioned, as well as in Mark's gospel, it's in dying that he reveals himself as God. We know he is God because of the way he dies. Yeah, see now most people wouldn't think that. They would think we know he's God because he does these miracles, but the reality is what John is telling us is that we know he's God by the way he dies. By the way he does. And not even by the resurrection. Now it takes right. the resurrection for us to understand what we saw on Good Friday. But when the apostles on this side of Easter and this side of Pentecost look back on Good Friday, they recognize what, what they had undergone and that that was the moment in which he's shown to be God. And that's why the centurion cries out, this Behold, is, this is, is the, the Son, Son of God. God. When we look at John 18 and we look at John 19, we've got these final closing words of Jesus at the, at the table. Right. And then they cross the Kidron Valley and he enters into his agony in the garden. Um, and then Judas betrays him. Right. And there's all sorts of dynamics. And then John tells us that Peter takes the sword and cuts off Malchus's ear. Right. And then we end up in the court of Pilate. So take us through the, the, the dynamics of what's going on in the betrayal and what's going on in the garden. Yeah, so Jesus in John's gospel, and each one of the gospels tells a different dimension of this kind of inexhaustible experience that Jesus lives. In John's gospel, Jesus is is pressed toward the cross, right? And so in the garden, he says to Peter, after Peter has cut off Malchus's ear, Jesus rebukes him because he says, I, I have a cup to drink. You're interfering with my moment. And then of course he heals Malchus. And, and when Jesus comes to the cross, he's come to the work he has to do. So from the very beginning of the gospel, John two, when he's at the wedding of Cana, which the anticipates hour. the this. hour. He keeps telling everyone, my hour is not yet. My hour is not yet. Well, the hour has come, right? And the hour is the hour of the suffering, the, houring, the hour of the agony. And he's, anxious is not the right word, but he's pressed to ri arrive at that moment, to do the work he's come to do, right? And he is troubled that 
Peter would interfere with that, that anyone would interfere with that, because this, this is what he came into the world to do, right? In John's Gospel, that's, that's where all the pressure is, is toward that climactic work of God in suffering and dying. And so here he is. Um, Judas betrays him there in the garden. Jesus identifies himself, I am. I am. Right. And they fall over, not just Absolutely. once, but I think I'd have stayed down the first time. I don't know that I'd have gotten back up and asked that, you know, yeah. answered that question again after the first one. But which is one of, one of the things that's and that that answers what's happening in the Revelation when the the divine name is spoken and everyone falls. So in Johannine theology, right, when you put the gospel alongside the Revelation, apocalypse, right. Revelation, you get either we bow out of adoration each time we hear the holy name or the holy name takes us down right right i mean so they they they're literally overcome by the power of the name right they they're brought low by what is spoken when he says the i am it's a way of john letting us know who this is who's speaking and that the divine name is being spoken by the one in agony the one suffering is god yeah and then later on peter post the Malchus event is asked at a fire, aren't you one of his disciples? And he says, I am not. So right. now I'm thinking there's John has put an I am not here. You go back to John, John 1, 1 yeah. and John the Baptist, are you the prophet? Are you Elijah? Which Jesus said he was, but John says, I am not. So there's the I am and then there's the I am not. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think there's so much happening there. I mean, John is... John the Gospel writer is a is a master of irony and nuance, right? So he's he's doing a lot with each one of these stories. But the contrast is meant to, to stand out to us that between the I am's of Jesus and the I am nots of, of John the Baptist in the beginning and Peter in the end. But I, I I think we have to be careful not to mishear that as in some way a call oh, for I'm not our humanity I'm to not be diminished. Jesus, yeah. right. right. I mean there is a there's a kind of false humility that I think can work its way into our circles where we kind of downplay our own humanity in order to play up his divinity. And I, I don't think there I don't think that's what John is doing. Right. I think he is drawing attention to the ways in which Jesus I am statements stand out over against what we say about ourselves. Then the question becomes what does he want to say of us? What does he want us to say of ourselves? Does he want us to say, I am not? Or does he want us to kind of realize that we're included in what he is saying? And I think that's, that's where you start to get at the heart of what's going on in the Gospel of John. Yeah, both, both Peter and John uh, the Baptist are both at a moment of wrestling with their identity. Right. And John doesn't want to admit he's the Elijah to come, though his father has prophesied Just that that's he's the he Elijah to come. Yeah. Jesus has said that clearly to the disciples. And yet John, even, even in the baptism where he baptizes Jesus, he holds Jesus at arm's length. And it almost becomes a telltale understanding of why he is offended and scandalized by Jesus when he's thrown into prison. I think that's it. So, I, And I, I think this is intentional, not only by John, but other gospel writers, that those two men, one at the beginning and one at the end of Jesus' ministry, they refuse to be served by Jesus. They want to serve him. They think they know who he is and what that requires of them. So Jesus comes to be baptized and John says, no, you should baptize me. I'm not worthy even to unlace your shoes, right? And Jesus says, no, in order to fulfill all righteousness, you do need to baptize me, right? And he comes under the hand of John and the spirit settles on him. And then at the end of Jesus' life, in John's gospel, Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. And Peter says, no. No, don't do that. It's not for you to do. I'm supposed to wash your feet. And if we're not careful, that strikes us as right and good, right? That these men know they're not Jesus and they're owning their, their humanity. But in both cases, what happens next is they lose faith. The next time we see John the Baptist after his I must decrease statement, you know, he must increase and I must de decrease. The next time we see him, his, he's in prison and saying, are you the one or should we look for another? He's questioning not only himself, he's now questioning Jesus, Jesus himself. Right? And ex that's exactly what happens with Peter, although it's even more extreme in that Peter goes all the way to denying him, not just questioning yeah, he, him, but denying him. He commits the same sin, basically Judas does, except he finds his way back. Absolutely. Um, okay, so in light of that, we get to this moment 
where John is the only one standing at the foot of the cross with the three Marys. Right. The other disciples have fled. Strike the shepherd, the sheep scatter. But John stays there. The right. beloved disciple stays there. And reminds me of the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. John doesn't focus so much on the bloody aspects right. of the death. Mar Matthew does, Mark does, Luke does. John talks to us about, he's contemplating what the God-man is saying. Absolutely. And what he is experiencing. Talk about that. Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that's striking about John the Evangelist, John the Beloved, is that he understands himself to have the same relationship to Jesus that Jesus has to the Father. So in John 1, he describes Jesus as the one who is with God. And then later on in the chapter, he says he's the, he, he is God and he's with God. And then later on in the chapter, he says he's the one who's in the lap of God. In the bosom of the in Father. In the bosom yeah. of the Father. That's the King James language, right? And then he is described as the one who leans, leans his on head Jesus. on his bosom. bosom, right? So he has the same relationship to Jesus that Jesus has to the Father. And then at the end of the gospel, Jesus gives him the same relationship to Mary. Behold thy mother. That he has to, to Jesus. And so what's happening, and Origen, early church father, says that what's happening in those moments is that John is becoming one with Jesus. He's taking Jesus' place, not in the sense of replacing him, but fitting inside of Jesus' in experience. Christ. He is He's coming to be Christ. in Christ. Absolutely. In relation to the Father, but also in relation to Mary, and in Mary to the whole church. So that what Jesus gives us is his place in relation to my neighbor and his place in relation to God, which is what's happening in the Lord's Prayer. When we say our Father, we mean the prayer of Jesus, his Father, and everyone else that Jesus has claimed as his own. And John is the one who embodies that for us at the foot of the cross with, with the Marys. And then we get to this final of the seven clauses that John talks about where, Je you know, Jesus, Mark's gospel makes it really clear that Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why? Right. John tells us he finishes with it is finished. So right. the entirety of Psalm 22 is prayed by Jesus as, an in as the chief intercessor through... You would never be a faithful Jew and read the first verse and the last verse of a psalm. You would recite that psalm. Yeah, it calls up that the psalm. whole psalm. Yeah. yeah, any quotation calls up the whole yeah. psalm. Yeah, and so that entire psalm is what Jesus is praying while he is enduring this. Yes. And he gets to the end and he says, to tell us thy, it is finished. So yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a question at you and I want you to take this all the way to the end. Okay. Adam falls. Hmm. This is the one who God says let us make. Now, Irenaeus and both Irenaeus and Tertullian would argue from a Christological perspective that let us make is a conversation of the Trinity. God, within but, God. Yeah. yeah. And there are those that would say, no, this is the, these are the heavenly council. Mm -hmm. I like the early church fathers. I trust right. their, their, yeah. their, their proximity, the apostles and to Jesus yeah. gives me a lot of confidence in what they're saying. So, God ends up walk, walking in the garden saying, Adam, where are you? He's looking for his Adam. So he's looking for the let us make. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so fast forward. Because I think sometimes when we get to it is finished, uh, we want to make it sound like something that diminishes it from what it really is saying there. Yeah. What's he yeah, saying? Yeah, I mean, usually when we, at least in, in my experience, when people talk about it is finished, that it refers to the plan of salvation right. in some abstract sense. But in John's gospel, it refers to the creation of the human being. And Father John Baer has a wonderful book on this, which is really just drawing out the implications of the teachings of the church fathers on John's gospel. And it is, it's pretty clear in the text, once you know that, that Jesus says, you know, so there's this moment where Jesus is brought by Pilate, exposed to the crowd, right. and Pilate says of him, Ecce homo. Behold, behold the, the human, human being. Behold the human being. So this is a statement not just about Jesus, but about ev everyone, about every human being. And then he goes to the cross, right? And blood and water flow from his side. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your, your mother. And I thirst. And then he says, it is finished. And what is being finished there 
is the creation of the Adam, the creation of the humanity that God always purposed to make. So the early church fathers make this distinction between Adam, the first Adam, and the last. The first Adam is innocent, but he's not perfect. He's created toward something. He's created toward the fullness of God, but he doesn't have it yet. He's innocent, but he's not yet perfect because he doesn't share in the fullness. And Jesus is the one. He's the last Adam in the sense that he's the final, the fulfillment, the realization of everything God intended humanity to be. And if there's any doubt about that, the very next thing that happens in John's gospel is Mary is in the, in the garden weeping and a gardener appears yeah, to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're back in Eden. We're back in Eden. And she we have Eve, him to be a new the garden. Eve, mm-hmm. and a new Adam, and they're brought together. And John is making clear to us, right, that the, the human being is here, right? The, cre- the new creation has begun. And this, the, all the gospel writers in various ways draw, us, draw our attention to that. But John, in particular, is interested in the ways in which Jesus is the fulfillment of Genesis 1 and 2. Not of the plan of salvation in some abstract way, but God's intention always to bring humanity into the fullness of life. You know, as Paul says, the fullness of deity indwelled him bodily. And that that's, God means us to be included in that. What is true of John, the beloved is, is the call for all of us, right? To, to be in relation to Jesus in the same way that he is in relation to the Father and in the same way he's in relation to our neighbor. And I, I think that's, that's the project, that's the work that Jesus was so constrained to to accomplish and that he did accomplish. And here's the thing, in John's gospel, he accomplishes it on the cross. Resurrection just reveals it. It's accomplished on the cross. It's not a stage on the way to the accomplishment. This is why he says in John's gospel, if I am lifted up, I will draw draw all men to me. And in, in John's gospel, the glorification is not ascension, it's not resurrection. It's the cross. It's crucifixion. It's the cross. You know, and, and unfortunately, in a lot of our preaching about the cross, we see it as kind of the necessary darkness to get to the light, but not in John's gospel. I mean, that is the revelation. That, that is the glorification of, of God. So the journey to becoming human for us then uh, is an ongoing journey. We will not ultimately be there until the consummation, the receiving of our resurrection right. bodies, the deliverance of the entire uh, corpus from sin itself. Um, so in John 6, Jesus says, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. So now the process of becoming human requires a means by which that takes place. And, and so... John 6, when the disciples listen to that, a number of people leave when he says that because they think he's talking about cannibalism. Right, absolutely. Um, but we're, we're going to share the Eucharist in a few moments. And so talk a little bit about the two ways in which we look at except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Oh, absolutely. So if we go back to what we were saying earlier about Peter and, and John the Baptist kind of deflecting attention away from themselves, unwilling to own who they are, Unafraid, afraid to own who they are. Jesus comes to fill our humanity up, right? To, bra- to draw us into his fullness. So in John 6, he says, not only that I have come, but I've come to bring life to the world, to give my flesh as the life of the world. As the life of the world. And we often, again, hear that as he comes to die so we don't have to die, right? right? In some kind of exchange. And there's truth to that, but that's not what's happening in John's gospel. Because in John's gospel, what he's giving us is his abundant life, which is just a word for the life God himself has. Right. I want you to have the very life that I have, which is what he prays at the end. God, I want them, glorify them as you have glorified me with the glory I had with you before the worlds began. What is he saying? I want them to have the divine life yeah. that is in me. How are they going to do that? By consuming me. Eat me, and you will become me. And this is St. Augustine, another early church father. He has a mystical experience at At the the Lord's table. table, And that's what he hears the Spirit saying. Eat this and become what you eat. So it's not just, so so Zwingli didn't get it right. It's not not just a memorial. It is a sacrament. Oh, yeah, and it's tragic the ways in which after the Reformation, in Protestant tradition, so many Protestant traditions, we lose that sense of Christ giving himself to us, being present here. I, as you know, I did my doctoral research on the Lord's Supper in the Pentecostal tradition. 
And one of the things that I, mean, I, I grew up in a church, we did communion once a year at a watch just night because, service. Just because in case you had sinned the whole year, because you could only <laughs> right. do it so you discern the body of Christ the right way. Otherwise, you're in deep trouble. And I was terrified of taking it because <laughs> I thought if based on what First Corinthians says, if I took it with unconfessed unworthy, sin yeah. in my life, if I was unworthy, I might die. But there was no benefit to taking it. There was no grace in it. It was all a memorial unless you were sinning. And I assumed I was sinning, which was probably a good assumption. <laughs> and so I, I didn't take it as a kid. And then as an adult, as a pastor, kind of falling in love with the Lord's table, being consumed by it, being led by the Spirit to it, and then starting to read Scripture again with new eyes and starting to read the church fathers on on the Lord's Supper, and then eventually coming to read our own tradition. In, in 1914, at the Hot Springs event that becomes the founding event for and the Assemblies of the God. The Assemblies of God. And, you know, I teach at a Assemblies of God University now. They began and ended that meeting with communion, which was typical for those early Pentecostal, Pentecostal. leaders. Right? And because they didn't believe in memorialism, they called it. Right. They believed in real presence. And D.W. Kerr, who actually ended up writing the doctrinal statements for the Assemblies of God, he presided at the end of the meeting. And he gives a sermon, which we still have, and he says in that sermon, this meal has a pastness to it, that's the word he uses, and a futureness, but it's not about the past or the future, it's about the present. And then he says this, and this is virtually a direct quote, at this table, the blood still flows fresh from Calvary, from the wounds, the, the still open wounds of Jesus on the cross. This is the present tense of his suffering. Now think about that. Right? That's profound. Think about that. Right? That's what. And that's Pentecostal. That's Pentecostal, right? And what I found in my research is that that was not the exception. That was the rule. That was the rule. That the, the, the fathers and mothers in my own tradition, not just the church's tradition globally, but my own tradition, believed that about communion. And then as a pastor, I, I proved that week after week. I found it to be true Absolutely. again and again. And I think that's what, that's what John's gospel is bearing witness to and what the church fathers are bearing witness to and what the mothers and fathers of, of my own tradition knew that I'm just still learning and still falling into. Well, let's pray over the elements yes. and then we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the bread and the cup and then we're going to break bread together. So I invite you to just join us in prayer. Father, as we come before you, we bring before you bread and beverage, things that have come from the ground and from the vine, but they have been processed through human hands. This is not simply grain or grapes. This is bread and wine. Human hands have been involved, Father, in bringing you this as a gift. And Father, you gave us your greatest gift in your Son. And Lord Jesus, you lifted up the bread and the beverage. And you said, this is my body, this is my blood. As often as you partake of this, you do this in remembrance of me. Blessed Holy Spirit, as you presided over that Paschal Supper, and as you established with Christ that which we now partake of. I pray you would overshadow these elements, that they become unto us the real presence of Christ, that we might feed on him and drink of him for his name's sake. Amen. So, Chris, when I, when I said we process this with human hands, just weigh in on that for a moment and why that's significant in relationship to the Eucharist. Well, notice God doesn't ask us to bring back to him the raw materials of the earth, but what we've made of them, right? As you said, not grain, but bread that we've made, not grapes, but wine that we've made. And, and I think it says a lot, but one of the things it says is that it's drawing our humanity toward fullness. Yeah. Not, not what nature is on its own, but what we make of it. That's what God wants from us. And, then, and, and it ties in. So when Jesus says, this is my body broken for you, it's a much bigger oh, statement absolutely. than we realize. Absolutely. And, so, yeah, and, and it's important to see how the language the church has had for this is that it's sacramental. It's not right. literal. We're not cannibals, right? But it is also not simply figurative. Right. And this is one of the things that, that's impoverished our spirituality is that we think it has to be one or the other of those things. Either it's literal or it's figurative. But the church says, no, in Jesus, reality itself is transformed. It, exactly. Something it's, else is it's possible. It's a mystery. And we can, Jesus is the only human being 
who can be himself and me in such a way that I'm myself and him. Yeah. That, that's not possible for anyone else, right? right? And that's true not only of human beings, but of what we make. Yeah. And it's that profound. he fills all things. This is what Paul says over and over in, in God's Ephesians. intention is to be all in all right. and, and for in us all, to have the fullness of him right. who fills everything with himself. Right. So the gospel is just much more glorious than oh, we think it is. It is. We, we, have, we have shortchanged God and ourselves. Absolutely. Let's eat together. In the same way, Jesus takes the cup after supper. There were four cups in the Passover Seder. The third cup was left at the head of the table. The firstborn would run to the door and beckon for the Spirit of God to come in hopes of Elijah or Messiah. And Tonight, on the night that Jesus is betrayed, he takes that third cup and ends the mystery and says, no, it's not Elijah, but I am the Messiah. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And I'm reminded of the fact that David said, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits mm. toward me? Mm. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And so Jesus said, drink it all. Let's drink it together. And what I'd like to do right now, because at the table, I have personally as a pastor seen more healings and deliverance at the table. The early church prayed for the sick at the table. They ministered to the ill and the oppressed at the table. They prophesied at the table. All of the worship of the early church is recorded for us, but we tend to overlook it and make up our own directions. But right now, if you're battling something in your body, something in your mind, I want you to lay your hands on your heart and just join me as we invite the healing Jesus to come and to deliver and set free. Father, I thank you that your presence is healing presence. I thank you that you sent your word, your son, to heal us of all of our diseases. Blessed Holy Spirit, I thank you that you draw us in to the communion that is the very triune God, that communion of the endless dance of love. In your love, O oh God, come now, overshadow these, your sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, with that healing grace, and let every infirmity bow its knee to the authority of the risen Christ. I thank you, Lord, that though there are many afflictions of the righteous, you deliver us from them all. Let your salvation and your deliverance be seen in your goodness being manifest in the midst of every conflict and affliction being faced. Let your healing grace be made known. In Jesus' name, amen.